<clears throat> Greetings, good and faithful students. Welcome to this special video edition of ME273. I am your host, El Gallo, and shall be taking you through building an implementation of the kinematic program solver that we all built together with Excel in class. So let's get started, shall we? A uh, couple things that I would like to point out. It is, of course, a video, and one of the benefits is certainly you can stop this at any point. Hopefully, your host will uh, show you things concisely and slowly in a way that you can easily stop and maybe do this on your own as you're watching. Um, and I would recommend that, that you don't just watch it. Actually work through these things and do it yourself. Uh, one thing you could do if you don't want to do it as I do it, um, watch the entire video and then try to do it on your own, best you remember it, cold. Um, or you could, again, have this video open on in one window and then try to have MATLAB open and do it as I go. Uh, it's up to you. I, it doesn't really matter how you do it, but I think the important thing is that you actually do this. Don't just watch me do it. All right. So uh, to remind you what we did in class here, you should be able to see this, is the kinematic problem solver we, solver we built with Excel. And as I go through the MATLAB version of this, uh, I'm going to look uh, point back to this and indicate uh, what we did here, remind you what we did here, and indicate what we're actually doing that coincides with that particular step that we used in Excel. All right. So let's go back to MATLAB. So this is what the MATLAB GUI, or sometimes it's called an IDE, uh, GUI stands for Graphical User Interface. Uh, IDE stands for Integrated Development Environment. Sometimes you see IDLE, Integrated Development and Learning Environment. Um, but this is what MATLAB looks like when you launch it. All right. So um, now I'm going to take you through the MATLAB version. Uh, I'm also going to show you a little bit what it might look like in Octave. But I'm going to mainly in this video stick with, with MATLAB, although you should be able to do the exact same thing in Octave. All right? uh, and I'm going to assume that you have been faithful in going through tutorials to the point that you know what you're looking at here. But I'll spend just a few minutes, or maybe seconds even, just quickly pointing a few things out. You should be well aware of these by now. Your layout may look a little different. You can choose how the layout looks. What I have currently is this command window in the middle. And of course, one can type in commands uh, directly in the command window. Over on the right-hand side, I have workspace. Hopefully, you can see this cursor here. Uh, the workspace keeps track of names. These are the variables that you defined and the values, the size. Again, if you don't know how to use this or you haven't familiarized yourself enough to the extent you know what I'm talking about, you should spend time doing that. All right. Uh, over here. This little area is similar to a Windows Explorer. It's a file management system. And you can see up here in this dialog box, this place up here, this is just a uh, showing me the current folder. Now by current folder, it means where I, it's a, it's a directory on my hard drive. And you can see where it's located. My C drive, I have a folder called Z. And then I have another one called A. It's just an empty one where I can start to, to store things just for uh, to illustrate things for this video. All right. So this is the file system here. You can see what your current folder is here. Um, if you save anything, that's where it's going to be saved. That's what current folder essentially means. Also down here, uh, you'll see what happens down here in this little details window. The most important ones, though, are the, the file system and this workspace that we'll make use of. All right. We're not going to type in a series of commands. We're actually going to write a program. And the program, what, what MATLAB calls a program, is a script. All right. So there's a few ways to uh, tell your, your MATLAB GUI that you want to write a new script, or you want to write a new program. Now, once I open up a script file, you're going to see it's, it's just an editor. It, all it is is a text editor that will ultimately tell the interpreter, the MATLAB interpreter to look at. And once we tell the MATLAB interpreter to look at our script file, it'll look at all the commands and do what we've told it to do. Right, but first we have to 
type out all our commands into a uh, into a uh, uh, file e uh, editor. It's just a, a file editor. All right. So if you look over here under New Script, there's several ways to do this. You can choose New Script. You could click that if you want. You can also do Open. If I click Open, it says what do you want to open? There's recent files here. You could open one of those or go to this top one. It says Open and then choose something to open. Uh, there's also on the command window you can do it here. So for instance if you want to create a new file so let's I'm gonna type in the word edit alright and I'll type in um, let's call it the same thing we called our uh, Excel file. This is going to be kinematic. It's probably good habit to get in in the habit of uh, labeling your files with subscripts, single single strings of, of characters without any spaces. And Windows can deal with that and Macs also but uh, if you ever graduate beyond these little fundamental things boxes then you're gonna have troubles if you don't uh, if you put spaces in your file names. Anyway that's why I'm putting a uh, subscript or a underscore here. Kinematic problem solver right now this doesn't exist yet so once I hit enter it's gonna think for a moment and you can see it pops up it says MATLAB editor it's gonna it's gonna try to open up this file in a MATLAB editor but it doesn't exist yet so you'll notice it says file and it has the folder location here it has the the, the path it says kinematic problem solver dot m right so the first thing you'll notice it's trying to create a file for me that does not exist it says do you want to create it Notice it's .m. I guess little m stands for MATLAB, but a simple .m file is what we call a script or our MATLAB programs. All right. So it doesn't exist. It says, "Do you want to create it?" I'm going to type yes, and you can see a new window has popped up. All right. So I'm actually going to move this window over to the right. All right. This is it's a it's called a MATLAB editor. You can see it says editor right here in this tab and it it's all it is is an editor it's just a place where you can put text nothing magical necessarily will happen inside here unless we tell it to right now if you look back over here real quick and i i just moved the window it's right now it's covering up most of the gui i'm just going to keep it open on the right here if you look back over to the left in this this explorer area you'll notice that it did indeed create a new file called kinematicproblemsolver.m and it stored it in my little empty folder I called A. I just wanted an empty place to store it so you see what it looks like. All right, so let's get the let's get the editor back. I just all right, and um, probably to make it look nice, I'm going to make maximize this. All right, uh, you don't have to do this. Yeah, just make it a little easier to look at. All right, all right. So here's where we're going to start. Uh, writing our programs. And a program in MATLAB or a script is just a series of commands like you might type into the command window. Probably in your tutorials you've been practicing typing things directly into the command window. If you haven't written a program yet, this is how to do it. A program or a script, a .m file, is simply a series of commands. And you'll notice this little green button up here. Everybody see this? If I click that little green button, there's nothing for it to do. But if I have a series of commands, when I click that green button, the interpreter will now start looking at my commands and will execute everything I've told it to do within this uh, script file in order. Right? So there's no reason to click, click run yet because there's nothing there to, to, to do. Right? So uh, the first thing we have to do when we write a program, this is good habit to get into. I'm going to type in the word clear. And I'm going to include a uh, semicolon. You've probably discovered by now that most commands you enter into MATLAB you have to terminate with a semicolon, even if there's no output. Uh, if it's a, if it's a uh, command or a line that might include some output, you suppress the output by including the semicolon. But again, even some commands that don't have any output, you usually put a semicolon there. So, in this case, clear that clears the, uh, the the memory of all the random access memory of all the variables uh, we don't have any variables yet and so if I'm just starting a program out you might think why do you want to clear everything out if you don't have anything in there yet and the, the, the answer is simply that it's just a
precautionary uh, step to take because you may, and it's unlikely, but stranger things have happened, you may actually have defined a variable in a previous program that you've run and for some strange reason the random access memory has held on to that and thinks that there's still a variable out there called whatever variable you may have used and it could potentially cause confusion and some uh, crosstalk with this current program. So it's just good practice to clear it. Also I'm going to do this. I, so uh, by the way if you if you have you can put more than one command on a line if you separate things by a semicolon. So I'm going to do this CLC Right, so I like to start every one of my programs or my MATLAB scripts with these two commands on the very first line. CLC will clear the command window. And what do I mean by that? Let's let's go to the command window real quick. So here's the the graphical user interface again. So let's say that I was playing around here and I, I defined something called A, a variable called A equals three. All right, and so it, it, if I hit enter, it reproduces it for me and says, hey, you just defined something called A equals 3. And you can see over here in the workspace, so this gives you a little hint about what the workspace does. I've now defined a variable called A. I assigned it the value 3. Uh, the size, by the way, if you haven't already delved into this, I'm going to just very quickly go over this. MATLAB thinks everything's a matrix. And that's really what MATLAB stands for, M-A-T, Matrix, L-A-B, Lab. So it really is short for Matrix Lab. That's what MATLAB means. Probably should say MATLAB, I guess. Um, although a mate, mate lab might have, you know, maybe not the greatest connotation. So let's go back to MATLAB. Uh, and it defaults, everything, every variable in MATLAB defaults to double precision. And uh, if you read those first couple chapters in the book, you'll know a little bit about what that means. Um, so I, I don't want to spend too much time there. But the workspace is for keeping track of all your variables. Makes it easy to debug is what that's useful for. So let me just demonstrate what the clear and the CLC command do real quick. If I type clear here, which is the first command I wrote down on my script, you'll notice it will clear out as I hit enter here. It completely cleared out the workspace here. So if I had one variable or a hundred variables, it'll clear those all out. It clears the random access memory. So now MATLAB doesn't think there's any variables defined. And watch what CLC does when I hit CLC. It clears out all this stuff in the command window and just brings the, the prompt right back up to the top. Just makes it look nice and neat. So go back to the script now. Every Every time I write a script or a MATLAB program, I always start out with these two commands. It just makes look, things look nice, cleans up the random access memory, and, and uh, basically sets us up ready to go. Right? Now, uh, if you have a space, if you have a blank line in a MATLAB script, it'll just skip. If there's nothing there, it just goes and finds the next, uh, the next uh, line to execute. So it's a good practice to separate commands or at least sets of commands in a MATLAB program or a MATLAB script by spaces. Right? So now, um, the next thing I'm going to, get, going to do is define our variables that we're going to use, that MATLAB's actually going to use. And this is going to be our first trip back to look at the Excel file. You may remember, and I'm going to highlight it here, all right? I'm going to highlight this upper left part. Uh, you may recall that I like to call this the control panel. What we did is put a label for all the, the variables that I defined, a delta t, x0, v0, and acceleration. I put the labels in this column and adjacent to that I defined via the way that Excel defines names or variables. I defined all the variables adjacent to these with the same name and then assigned values here. All right? So let's build our control panel, although we're not really going to call it a control panel because we can't quite use it like we do the uh, Excel control panel but you can think of it as analogous to building the control panel. We're going to define all of the variables we're going to use in our MATLAB script. So go back to the MATLAB editor. And remember there were four of those things and so we're, we're just going to do the same thing. And I'm, I'm actually going to use the exact same names, the exact same variable names that I used in the Excel file. And uh, so let's label though. Let's put a little label here. In the, one, one more time back to the Excel picture. You can see where the the uh, uh, the, the uh, control panel is is uh, located here. Excel is nice because everything's laid out for you. You can see these columns here. The graphs have a specific location. 
So there's really no need to label things so much here, but in, in a MATLAB script, and let's go back to the editor, in a MATLAB script, it's actually useful to label things. So how do I label things? If I hit an uppercase phi, which is just a percent sign, and I don't know if you can see that, it looks green. See that's a little bit green? This is called a comment. Anything that has a percent sign in front of it, any line that has a percent sign or any entry that has this little percent sign is called a comment sign. You can see it's labeled comment up here. See this at the top? Anything behind that will be ignored by the interpreter. So you can make a note to yourself. So for instance, I'm just going to say that the next few lines I'm defining, or a, a better word is declaring. That's, that's a computer science term. That's kind of a computer science-y term to say. I'm, I'm declaring the variables and assigning the values. So you might even say declaring and assigning variables. All right? And what I mean by that, again, it's just like what we did in that control panel, is I'm going to write out the name of the variable I'm going to use, and I'm going to give it a value. In other words, I'm going to assign it a value. So let's start with that delta t. Remember, we're, we're building this um, kinematic problem solver, and that means we're going, to, we're going to plot a function, a couple functions. We're going to plot that v as a function of time, and acceler uh, sorry, position as a function of time. And so in order to plot the points, we're going to have uh, the time column essentially separated by, by delta t. So this delta, and I put underscore t. You can use underscores in your variable names in, in MATLAB, by the way. Oh, and keep, keep, it, keep in mind also, this is very important, MATLAB is case sensitive. So if I have all lowercase delta t, if I were to capitalize delta t, capital D, capital D delta t versus small d delta t would be two different variables. MATLAB would consider that two different things. All right, so here's how, so that, that's, um, to define a variable, I don't have to go anywhere and say I'm going to use this. Just typing it out in MATLAB in the script like this is sufficient to tell MATLAB that I've got a variable called delta t. I don't have to go to a name box or anything like that. To assign it, Remember, the equal sign in a computer program means you're assigning. So this literally can read, there's a variable called delta t to which I am assigning the value. And let's just give it something. We might change this later, but let's go 0, 1. I don't remember. I think that's what we used in the kinematic, kinematic problem solver. We, we can look back and see. Now, notice there's this little yellow box that shows up. If I terminate this with a semicolon, then that yellow box disappears. See that? That means it's not going to output anything. If I didn't include that semicolon and I ran it, it would spit out the value of delta t into the command window for me. All right, and I don't necessarily want that to to do that. Now I'll show you what the output's going to be in a moment here. All right, well, so that that's how you define a variable. So let's go through. Remember in our Excel sheet. I guess we used a thousandth of a point, or a, sorry, a thousandth of a second for delta t. We can change that. We need an x0, v0, that's the initial position and initial velocity respectively. And we need an acceleration. So let's just use initially the same values here. So go back to your MATLAB editor. And I'm just going to use the subscript, or the, sorry, the underscore. So we'll start at position 0. We can change these later. And I'm going to start at initial velocity equals zero or is assigned to be zero. All right, so remember that's what that I'm assigning zero to the initial position and I'm assigning zero to the initial velocity. Using that underscore you can use that like a subscript. All right? So it's really easy to keep track of what these variables mean. Alright, finally acceleration. I'll just use Excel and I'm going to assign that. I think we had five to start with. If we were going to do a free fall I'd call it negative nine point eight. Right? Alright, so this this little section this, this basically tells me in these next four lines here, if somebody were reading this, it's more or less clear. You might you could put more detail in here if you wanted to. For instance, I might do something like this. I'm not going to take too much time to put all these labels in, but I might put another comment here and say this is time increment in seconds. All right? Right. If you were writing a program that you were going to, for instance, uh, submit 
Hint, hint for a professor to look at. You might put a lot of these little comments in here to make it really clear what the person reading your code is looking at. All right. Uh, for our purposes here, I'm not going to take too much time to, to do this because I want this to move along. But this is a, again, this is this, this, this comment sign, this percent sign. And the interpreter will come through and say, ah, you're assigning 0 0.01 to this variable. I think we're going to do 0, 0, 001, right? You're assigning a thousandth to this delta t. And then it's going to see this and say, oh, I don't care what that says. I'm just going to go down to the next line, right? This is just for our purposes only. It's our, for our benefit. This is a time increment in seconds. That's a thousandth. That represents a thousandth of a second. Okay. All right. So that is equivalent. Go look back at the Excel spreadsheet. That's equivalent to building your, your control panel. Although, once again, we won't use it as a control panel. Now, we're going to next build our columns. Well, as you might suspect, we're writing a script or we're writing a program. So unlike Excel, there aren't going to be any columns which display all our numbers. However, I want to point out, keep in mind that in the Excel, in Excel, all of these all of these numbers under the time column, position column, and velocity column, they are indeed stored. Right? They're all stored in these columns. And so we're going to do the same thing. It's just we can't use columns. There are no columns in a MATLAB script to store all the numbers. Uh, but we do have to store them somewhere. And furthermore, notice this, every one of these numbers are indexed. See, as I as I drag this down in Excel, see over here, this gray, oh, these numbers over here also turn gray. In other words, the zero times zero is the second box. Point zero zero one is box three, going down column D, of course. So the index, it, the row numbers are all indexed, right? I just wanted to point that out. They're there is a way that MATLAB actually keeps track of every one of these things. So for instance, this number is D column and the index of the row index is number 11. So that's the 11th index relative to zero time at two, right? Okay, now um, I gave this, in, in Excel, I gave this uh, column a label, time. And that just had to default because in Excel you got to start with one. Excel always starts counting at one. And interestingly, so does MATLAB. MATLAB actually starts counting at one also. You might say, well, don't we always start counting at one? Eh, not really. Some computer languages start counting at zero, right? So just be aware of that. The point I'm trying to make here is that my label, which doesn't, it, which isn't part of the numerical values here, that's just the label time, labeling this column, started in location number one. And so my zero, my initial time zero, had to start at position number two, just because I used the column label time in position number one here. All right, in MATLAB, we're actually going to be able to call our initial time location number one. All right, so just be aware of that. It's a little bit subtle, all right, but when we go back to MATLAB, I'll show you how we're going to store all the numbers in our in quotes time column column in quotes because there's no column in MATLAB but we're gonna start storing things a little differently in Excel we had to start out with time 0 at 2 we're gonna use location number 1 for the time alright so go back to your script and here is how we're going to deal with storing all of those numbers alright we're going to store them in a one-dimensional array okay now if you have not spent any time in your tutorials studying something called a one-dimensional array, then it's time for you to go do that. You might even want to stop this, perhaps. You might want to stop this video. Go type into Google one-dimensional arrays in MATLAB. Just type as, as, just what I said. And do a little tutorial. All right, You can always come back to the video at this point and uh, keep watching. All right? So why don't you do that? Uh, assuming you did that or you're relatively up on the concept of a uh, one-dimensional array in MATLAB. Here's how we're going to go about it. First of all, I'm going to put another comment in, and I'm going to call this pre-allocating arrays. All right, that's a really fancy word. You could also say predefining the arrays. All right. Now, MATLAB, the, the MATLAB interpreter is very, very uh, useful 
And you don't actually have to do the step that I'm going to do to use arrays. MATLAB is actually capable of dynamically uh, changing sizes of arrays as it goes. But what I'm about to do is just good programming practice, all right? And it's a, it's a good habit to get into. And I'll describe what it is. Now, you should know, if you've done your tutorials and you've uh, spent some time, you should know that an array is just a way. It's just a series of numbers or a set. Maybe a set is a better term. It's just a set of numbers, kind of like the column in Excel is a set of numbers. But it's a set of numbers that are indexed and are stored in the random access memory. All right? But we give each array a name. Okay? So here's how we do this. All right? So I'm going to start. I'm actually going to, very much like my, my columns in Excel, I'm going to define a time array. All right? Now here's the assign, that equals sign. Remember, equals means assign. I'm going to assign to this thing called time. All right, now this is going to seem a little mysterious until I type it out, and then I'll tell you what I've just... I mean, you can see what I type, but I'll tell you what, what that means. All right. All right, um, I'm going to use little n here. Okay. And we'll terminate it with a semicolon, right? All right, now what in the blazes did I just do there, right? There's a command called zeros, just as it appears here. I don't, it's not spelled wrong. That is the command. There's no O-E-S. It's Z-E-R-O-S, right? So what I have just defined, one comma N in parentheses here, what this means is I've defined a, a, an array. The one means one dimensional array. It actually means one row. And so you could, you could imagine that this will be a a set of numbers which if I were to display it and it really doesn't matter if I display it or not because we're gonna make a graph eventually but if I were to display it all of the numbers associated with this array one dimensional array called time would be in a row and it means this one comma n means one row all right with n columns or n entries that's what that means and furthermore the zeros does two things it actually tells the random access memory, it says there's an array called time, which is a set of n numbers, and we're going to be using this throughout the program. And so you better carve out a place in your random access memory to store all these things. It basically, it's a way that the interpreter tells, interacts with, in this case, my laptop, and says, OK, laptop. We're going to be using this thing called a time array, so get ready and carve out some places for us. Oh, and, and, and oh, by the way, remember where they are so you can get to them quickly. Right? That, that's what that does. That's the first thing the zeros command does. The second thing that it does, it assigns all n values of this one dimensional array to zero. That's what the zeros command does. There's also a ones command. I could have typed time equals ones, O N E S, one, comma, n. And that would assign one to every every member of the array or the set of, of, of variables. All right? Uh, I don't know if there's a twos. There might be. It, it stops at some point, right? So, but zeros is useful. Setting everything to zero makes it really useful, and it makes it easy to debug when you have troubles. And we'll we'll encounter that as we go through the semester, right? Now you might be thinking, all right, you've defined one comma n. What the heck is n? Ah, good question. I'm glad you asked that. I need to define what n is before we get to this point. So that's another variable that I have to put up here. So sometimes as you're programming, you realize that there's some things that you needed to actually uh, define or, or indicate before you get to a certain point. And so the interpreter, if it got to this point without me having defined what n is, it would get confused and yell at me. Right? Uh, well, not really yell, but it would have an error. All right, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, up here in this list of declared and assigned variables, I'm going to include a little n. And so this is how many points we want to plot, essentially. That's really what we're doing here. Remember, the time uh, column in Excel had a whole bunch of numbers we were going to plot. And I don't remember how many. We did like 1,000, didn't we? I don't know, 10,000. So I can put in 10,000. Don't forget to terminate it with a semicolon. And this means now that time, time is an array with 10,000 numbers associated, right? And they've all been set to zero initially. And it also told the computer, 
once the interpreter gets through and sees this, that look, you better set apart 10,000 locations for storing these numbers, and I want you to remember where they're at so we can get to them quickly as my program runs. Okay. Now, um, one more note about arrays. You don't have to program it this way. However, the way I'm doing this with these one-dimensional arrays turns out to be the easiest way to make plots at the end here. Right? All right. So that's that. That's the time array. Now, remember, in Excel, we also had a position and a velocity column. Right, so let's do the same thing. We need we need a, a column. Well, again, there's no column in MATLAB, but we're going to need a one-dimensional array called position. And I'll do the exact same thing I did with time. I will assign to position an array, one-dimensional array of n values, and I'll set them all initially equal to zero. So that's what that did. Right, and we need the same for velocity. You'll notice I'm using variable names. In this case, these are the array names, right? So all those n values are associated with this array name. I'm using array names that are logical. If I want to keep track of velocity versus time, why not just call the array velocity? Makes perfect sense, right? Okay, one comma n. All right, and so I have, I have now predefined a time, position, and velocity. These are one-dimensional arrays. They have been reserved to have n where I've specified n above here. They all have been specified, or, uh, sorry, pre-allocated with 10,000 locations. That means there's 10,000 values, 10,000 separate independent values associated with each one of these time, position, and velocity arrays now. All right. And again, I leave it to you to play with arrays. If you haven't done that, you are urged to go play with one-dimensional arrays, see how they behave. All right. So that pre-allocates our arrays. Right? And so now, what we want to do, remember, our goal is to evaluate the functions. If you look back at Excel, we not just uh, created the columns for each of these things and the number of rows in each column. We program these things to have certain values. That's the next step. But remember, as part of our programming, we not only programmed, but remember I did this little drag down stuff. In other words, if I highlight this, remember this is what was typed in to this box here. The entries are all color coded, so that was my programming, that specific box, which happens to be the initial position. And remember, I took my cursor then and I hovered, right, hit enter. I covered over that little square. See, the cursor goes from fat plus sign to skinny. I hover over that, and then I drug this down. Right, you may remember doing that. All right, that was the iterative process. In other words, I, that's how you do something in Excel. That's how you do something over and over and over again. All right, go back to our MATLAB editor. How do we do something over and over and over again in MATLAB? All right, the answer is a loop. All right, so we're going to implement a loop. Now, here's the next step. If you have not studied loops, in particular, we're going to use a very simple for loop, right? It's called a for loop. We're going to use a very simple for loop, and um, if you haven't studied that or done a tutorial, then it's time to stop the video and go do that immediately, right? You don't have to, but I think it's a good idea. All right. All right. If you're up on loops, then here's what the syntax of a for loop looks like in MATLAB. For and I'm going to use uh, an index called i. i, in this case, is a dummy index. All right? And it's a dummy index because it's, it really plays the role of, of keeping track of how many times we've gone through this loop. All right? And so here's the syntax, 1, colon, and I'm going to go through a number of times, which is the same exact number of times or points we want to plot. Or, in other words, the number of times we want to evaluate our position and velocity function as a function of time. I've got n times. I want to evaluate the function position and the function velocity n times based on those n times, right? No, no pun intended there. I, you know, n times with time. Get it? All right. Never mind. Uh, but there's 10,000 of those. So I want to go through this the same amount. So I'm going 1 to n, right? Now, um, 
you'll notice in MATLAB there's this little smart uh, little line coming down. It's expecting something here. And I'm going to type end. All right. Uh, end. That's the that's the called a for uh, for loop. All right. Uh, and what this means, I will start out at the value of one. It's assigned one to start with, and it will go through what's ever in here. So basically, where the cursor is, this this blinking cursor, where that is, I'm going to put some commands, and the commands that go there will be the ones I want it to do over and over again. So we'll come down after defining preallocating the arrays. It will see the four i equals one. It'll set i equal to one, and it'll start doing something down here, right? After it does whatever the commands in there are, it'll hit the end and it'll come back up and say, ah, I can go all the way from one out to whatever n is, right? And since there's no specification, the default increment is just one, integer one. So if, if i starts at one and does something, comes through the next time, it'll bump up the value of i by one to two. And then it'll come through and do something. It'll go through the loop and then come up I will be 3 the next time through, and it'll keep doing this until it gets to the value of n, which n we specified to be is 10,000. By the way, you know, if I highlight, if I put my, my little blinking cursor right next to a certain variable, MATLAB's very helpful. It shows you, it highlights all the occurrences of that same variable in your program. I'm just trying to point out what you're looking at. All right, so this is called a for loop, and by the way, you don't need to put a, you don't need to put a semicolon here. If I put a semicolon there, right, it makes a little orange box and says, eh, you don't really need that, right? So you don't need a semicolon after a four in a for loop, right? All right, so um, anything inside the for and the in commands will go through 10,000 times, right? So this is where we do our programming, right? So time, all right, now here is also where we can use the indexing nature of the for loop because I, I said was a dummy index. Well, it doesn't have to be a dummy index. Dummy index simply means you're not really going to use it. It's just a way to count. But we can actually make use of it and we can make use of it to index or to indicate where in the time or position or velocity array indicate where we're located. Right. So for instance, if I do this, time of i equals, right? Um, so if I start at zero, remember I said I wanted to start at zero? Okay. Um, the index, this is this one now in the index i. That's Basically that's why you, sometimes you start a for loop with this dummy i. i stands for index. Mm -hmm. Just a way to keep track of variables. This one plays the role of those rows in Excel. All right? So time of one, that, that, that really means that's the first entry in the time array. Okay? Now, granted, we're not even really going to print these out so that you can see all the values like you see in Excel. Right? But that's what that is. The I, in this case, is playing the, the role of the row number in, in our Excel, in our column of numbers here. It's, it's not a column, it's a bunch of numbers, but we got to have a way to indicate where we're at in the array. Right? So this will equal, now look what I'm going to do here. I minus 1 star, and I'm going to do this. Oops, delta underscore t. And then I'm going to do a little termination with a, with a semicolon. All right, you see what I'm doing there? So, think about what that will do. And the easiest way to think about what your program will do, especially in a loop, is just to start at the top and pretend you've just jumped into the loop and look at it and say, okay, i is going to be 1. So now I come down, this comes down here to the 4, the, the, the four command. Let's i equal 1, first time through the loop, and it comes down to this command now. So let's do what it says to do. Time of 1, now in in parentheses here, that one, that's going to be the location in the array. In other words, it's going to be the first number encountered in the array. That's just entirely analogous to the first row encountered in our time column in the spreadsheet. Right? So look at that. Time 
1 equals, now what, what's on the right hand side? It's assigned time of 1, that first memory location of the time array is assigned the value 1 minus 1 is 0. 0 times anything is 0. I, I happen to be multiplying by delta t and look what I get. So I get time, the initial time is 0. See that? What about the next time it comes through? It does that, then it ends, and then it comes through and 4i now, i is going to be 2. What will that be now? Time of 2, the second memory location. So it's already stored the previous time in the first memory location. Now i will be 2. So now it's going to uh, update the second memory location, or time of location 2. That's what that parentheses mean. And look, if i is 2, 2 minus 1 is 1 now, times delta t. So the second row will be 1 delta t later than time of 1, or the first row. But well, again, there's not rows here. There's just memory locations, but I'm trying to make it analogous to the Excel. So I think you can see what that's going to do. This will populate the time array just like we populated the time row in, in um, the uh, spreadsheet. All right? Now, it's going to be very easy to do position. All right? Now, you've got to be careful. Position of i. Now remember, let's look back real quick. Remember when we did position here, and if I double click it, we had to, when, when, when it came time to evaluate the function position with a specific time, I had to point over to this time column. Right? I had to use the value in a time column. Right? So let's go back to MATLAB. The way you do that in MATLAB is I'm assigning to position in the ith memory location. Now I want each memory successive position memory location to be the same as its corresponding time. So here's what I'm going to do. Now we're going to type in the the uh, equation here, and you may remember. I'll, if you don't remember, I'll, I'll type it out for you. X zero plus that's initial position plus v zero star, that's whenever you time something, it's star. Right now we're going to use the actual time which has just been calculated in this, in the loop, in this very time. The time was just calculated, it was the first time through the loop, we would be using time of 1, which is 0. And so that's what's going to go in here, but I've got to type it out explicitly. Time of i. See that? Okay. Now don't forget the position also has that one half a t squared term, so let's add that. And you notice I'm just I'm just using the parameters I've already defined. Uh, unlike Excel, by the way, if you type in these parameters, they don't get highlighted with color coded, right? Time. Now don't forget here time of i, but we've got to square it. One half a t squared. Terminate it with a semicolon, right? So all I've done here is calculate if the first time through. I will be 1, so that means position 1 in the position array. The first memory location in position array will be this, where I'm using the time, time of 1. I'm using the value of the time in the first position of the time array. Make sense, hopefully? All right, let's do velocity. Same thing. Velocity of i equals v underscore 0 plus Excel, may I remember this? Star time. We got a point to the time. It's adjacent time at the same indexed value. So I just put time of i here. Whoops. Try again. Time of i here. Terminate it with a semicolon. All right. Now that's all I'm going to put in the array. Oops. Velocity. If you misspell it, see that I got two t's there. I didn't do that on purpose. It would when I define velocity. Now, see if I if I if I have the cursor anywhere near the the particular um, in this case an array variable array name, it highlights the array elsewhere. It didn't do it before because I had two t's. See that if you got two t's, I think well there's no other thing called that. Right, so you got to be careful, right? But you can also get a little bit of help along the way by MATLAB here. That's all we're going to do within the loop. So let's just, you can delete these extra spaces. You could leave them there. there nothing's going to happen. All right. So now if we run this, all right, I'm going to go ahead and hit run just to make sure that everything's working. But now keep in mind, nothing will happen. 
Well, something will happen. It'll go through and it'll assign all these values. It'll actually do 10,000 calculations. It'll go through this loop 10,000 times. So that means it'll actually calculate a bunch of things a thousand times and store all the values in these arrays. All right. By saying it won't do anything, I meant that you won't see it do anything. All right. Because we're not telling it to do anything. I'm terminating all output with these semicolons here. So hit run. All right. Nothing really happens if you go to the uh, GUI now. Go back to that command window. You'll notice the only difference was is now we're populated over here in the workspace with all of these different variables that we just used in running the program. So first of all, you'll notice there's no error messages. If there was an error, a syntax error or any error of any kind, it would show up here in the command window. That there's nothing in the command window means it ran. And here's all the variables that were defined and used. All right. Now you can see Excel, and, and this is interesting. Look at the size here is really the thing to look at. Size one by one. Anytime you see a one by one, that was just a variable, a scalar variable or a scalar quantity that was defined. Look here, if I if I drag this out a little bit, see what I'm doing there? You can put your arrow over these little lines up here and drag. All right. You can see position, time, and velocity. This one, this one, and this one. All are 1 by 10,000 one-dimensional arrays. That means there's one row by 10,000 values. So everything in the workspace is consistent with what, how I think I define things. All right. All right. So that ran. So that's good. There's no errors. And so now what we want to do, remember we said we wanted to make a plot. And that's the last thing I'm going to do here. And I'm going to just get this plotted for you. Now, notice when we pre-allocated things, we made the position, velocity, and time. They're all the same size. In other words, each of these arrays has the same number of entries. And that makes it the most easy to plot in MATLAB. So I'm just going to show you this. There's a lot of ways to plot things in MATLAB. This is just one example of how to do it. And so I'm going to use the command right underneath the array. Now remember, it went through this array 10,000 times. It stored all 10,000 values of, in these arrays. The values of the function velocity and position as functions of time. It used those times in the calculation. Right? And so now we can go here, plot, the command plot. And if you have arrays that are the same size, you can tell in this plot command, look what I do here. I'm going to type in time, comma, and let's do position. Close parentheses. Right? I don't even have to indicate any indexes. The plot command knows already that time is an array with n values. And it also knows that position is an array of the same size. If these arrays weren't of the same size, this would not work. But since they are the same size, I can simply say make a plot of position versus time. What goes on the x-axis is goes first in the parentheses here. So x-axis, the time values will be used as the x-coordinates comma, the values in the position array will be used as the vertical or the y components in a plot. Right? And you can either terminate this or not. I, if I put the semicolon, since it's a plot command, it will automatically plot anyway. So you don't really even need to put that. Right? So if I hit enter, if I hit run now, watch what happens. It will automatically pop up a plot window for me. And there it is. Now, Take a critical look. Remember when we first made our first plot with Excel? You want to look at it and you want to think, is everything consistent with the program I have? Recall, I have 10,000 points that I wanted it to plot. It should have plotted 10,000 points here. By the way, I think it's obvious what the plot's doing. The plot is doing the same thing that that Excel command uh, scatter with smooth lines is doing. It's, pl it's plotting an infinitesimally small point and it's just connecting a smooth line between everything. So that's what we're looking at. Remember, you actually have 10,000 discrete plots, points plotted along here. All right. So first of all, 10,000 points, all separated by 1,000th of a second. 0 0.001 times 10,000 gives me 10 seconds. You can see over on the plot, I've got 10 seconds of position versus time plotted. All right. And notice, it's curved. 
it looks quadratic to me. So that means it looks to me like we're on the right track here. All right, now there's ways, and I'm going to leave this to you to look up. Uh, I won't put this in this video. It's already probably too long, um, so I'm going to bring it to a close. This is what I wanted to demonstrate. But you can actually add, add uh, axis labels, add a plot title. There's all kinds of ways to do that right in here in the program. You can manipulate things. Real quick before I call this good, all right, I'm going to close this down. And instead of position, what if we typed in velocity here? That means we'll be using the velocity uh, values as the y-axis versus the time. And so this should plot velocity. Now remember, for a constant acceleration, which is what indeed we have here, if I hit run, it should produce the plot for us. It should be a straight line, shouldn't it? And ta-da, there it is. There's our straight line, velocity on this axis, time on the horizontal, and we get our straight line, right? So oh, that is your kinematic problem solver. Uh, you can now play with this just like you did with the array. Um, I would suggest break this up into declaring and assigning variables, pre-allocating arrays, the main for loop, and plotting. Those are the four main parts. Variables, arrays, the loop, the plotting. Split these up and do yourself a favor, a little more in-depth study on each of these topics, and then come back to this program and play with it. All right? And try to do some of the problems or some of those little sample things we did. I believe we did that in our lab meeting. All right, well, that's all for now. Uh, stay tuned for the next video. I hope you enjoyed uh, the, 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 uh, the show tonight. This is your host, El Gallo, signing off, and may the force be with you.